Good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Steinmeier. I'm Leslie's president. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the fifth event in our 2021-22 Thought Leadership Series. Building on the speaker program we launched last year, we've invited a diverse array of inspiring guests, thought leaders from across the human arts of education, counseling and psychology, and the visual arts to share their work and their perspectives. A common thread is how we can strengthen our human connections and bridge gaps in access and inclusion, especially around mental health and wellness. Over the past few years, our community and society more broadly have experienced multiple traumas, the COVID-19 pandemic, attacks on our democracy, and a long overdue reckoning about racial equity. People of all ages and backgrounds have faced myriad disruptions and losses, and research shows that young adult, BIPOC, and low-income populations have been especially hard hit. Throughout these difficult times, Leslie has maintained its deep commitment to prioritizing health and wellness. With our longstanding commitment to social justice and to educating teachers, counselors, and expressive arts therapists, the Leslie community has been on the front lines of these fights. The work that Leslie faculty and staff do to prepare our students to face these challenges and become agents of change has never been more relevant. And in fact, our university's future growth includes forming innovative partnerships in mental health, in early childhood, in K through 12 education, in animation and digital production that will open new pathways and pipelines to prepare students for careers in fields where the need and relevance has never been greater. To help prepare Leslie students and faculty to meet these critical needs, we are collaborating with thought leaders like tonight's speaker, Marsha Medalli, CEO of Riverside Community Care. As Riverside CEO, Marsha leads one of the state's largest and most respected nonprofit mental health organizations. With both an undergraduate degree in psychology and an MSW from Boston University, she is a licensed independent clinical social worker. She began her career as a clinician before choosing to strive to make an impact through organizational leadership rather than one person at a time. Marsha has been at Riverside for 28 years, serving as its executive vice president COO, then its president, and then CEO in 2021. She received the Massachusetts Association for Behavioral Healthcare Robert Dorward MD Award for Mental Health in 2017, and is currently a member of the Commonwealth's Children's Behavioral Health Advisory Council. Serving over 40,000 people annually, Riverside's clinicians are on the front lines of our community's mental health crisis. Riverside is uniquely positioned to help prepare Leslie students for careers in counseling and psychology, and to help us address the mental health needs of our community. That is why I'm so excited and proud to announce that Leslie's new partnership is with Riverside Community Care. This summer, Riverside will open the Riverside Outpatient Clinic at Cambridge. That will be on our Doble campus in our Schwartz Hall on Mellon Street. This new center will be independently <laughs> operated and staffed by experienced mental health clinicians from Riverside in close coordination with our counseling center. This partnership will expand services available to our students, offer internships and work placements, provide trainings for staff and students, and open many avenues for research and practice in collaboration with Leslie faculty. Marcia and I are very excited about the synergies that will be created by bringing our two very talented communities together. I am therefore thrilled that she can be here tonight to share her hopeful vision about the future of mental health care. And I'm very pleased that Leslie Professor Susan Gare, who's our interim co-chair of our graduate counseling and psychology department, will after that lead a question and answer period. So Marsha, official welcome to Leslie. I look forward to our future opportunities for our community to get to know you and for us all to collaborate. Thank you very much, Janet. 
I'm very, very happy to be here tonight to talk about mental health and both the crisis we face now and how we got here and why there really is reason to be hopeful for the future. I'll start by telling you a bit more about the organization that I have the honor to lead, Riverside Community Care. We're a mental health, a community, uh, community based nonprofit behavioral health care and human service provider with administrative offices in Dedham, Massachusetts, but programs in about 80 different sites in central and eastern Massachusetts, and several of our services are statewide. Also, through remote and online work, we're in schools, businesses, and organizations across the country and in 22 other countries. Our range of services includes mental health and addiction services, developmental and intellectual disability and brain injury services, early childhood youth and family services, trauma response, suicide prevention, and more. In addition to those services, we have MindWise Innovations, a division of Riverside focused on using technology to provide behavioral health consulting and training, trauma-informed support, screenings and suicide prevention for schools, universities, businesses, government entities, and organizations nationally and internationally. Riverside helps about 40,000 people a year in Massachusetts and more than three and a half million around the globe. And we employ about 1,700 staff. Next slide, please. So Riverside and Lesley University have been collaborating on a number of different fronts for a while. Riverside provides Lesley students with internships in several of our programs, like our behavioral health outpatient centers and early intervention programs. And also MindWise Innovations, Riverside's division I mentioned earlier, is collaborating, collaborating with Leslie on a certificate program focused on suicide prevention and education, suicide prevention education for K through 12 teachers. Known as ACT for school staff, this certification will provide teachers with the ability to identify at-risk students and teach them how to have the tough but really important conversations with students around suicide with the goal of connecting students to the help they may need. And if you're wondering, ACT stands for Acknowledge, Care, Tell, as in tell a trusted adult. A second collaboration with MindWise is an assessment and intervention training involving Leslie's mental health counseling students who will learn assessment and intervention techniques as well as relevant ethical and legal precedents when working with someone who is contemplating suicide. And I'm very excited about the newest upcoming collaboration that you just heard President Steinmeier talk about a couple of minutes ago, a mental health outpatient center operated by Riverside right on the Leslie campus to serve students and also the local Cambridge neighborhood. The outpatient center will bring clinical expertise, including psychiatry and medication prescribing to the Leslie community and will be an additional training site for more Leslie graduate students. We're aiming to open in the summer, pending the completion of building renovations that are underway. The kind of this kind of collaboration between a university and a nonprofit behavioral health organization is groundbreaking. It is really a very progressive move, in my opinion, for a university to take the mental health of their students and its neighbors so seriously that it invests in working with an experienced behavioral health provider to bring a licensed outpatient center to campus. And frankly, I will not be at all surprised if this becomes a model for other colleges and universities around the country. Next slide, please. So let's talk where, about where we find ourselves in 2022 regarding mental health and access to care. Access to behavioral health services has been a simmering crisis for many years and the pandemic has made it much, much worse. Even in Massachusetts, 
where we have more psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers per capita than most states. There's been long waiting lists for outpatient therapy, for medication for prescribing, and even for inpatient psychiatric beds. And this has really been a problem for many years. I'll get more into why the shortage has existed for so long in a moment, but I'm sure you're all aware of the impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the mental health of our country's population and especially young people. The stress, isolation, disruption of social norms and opportunities, losses, whether of personal health, death of loved ones, the loss of the things we expect to be part of our normal everyday lives, like in-person classes or socializing with friends, chatting with coworkers at the office, all those things, financial stress, anxiety about not seeing people, and then anxiety about finally seeing people when returning to school or work after long absences. The unavailability of structured supports that people rely on, like AA or NA meetings and other group support systems, or just getting hugs and cheered up by hanging around with friends or family. The endless hours of looking at ourselves on Zoom or Skype, the list goes on. So many unusual or intensified stressors that we've all had to cope with it's just not surprising that the need for behavioral health care has skyrocketed. And the prediction is that the need is going to remain very high for the foreseeable future. Recently, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation published a brief about the pandemic's impact <clears throat> and noted that a survey revealed that more than one in three Massachusetts adults over age 19 reported needing behavioral health care for themselves or for a close relative during the initial year after the pandemic began. And you can see on the slide some of the national statistics on the increase in depression, substance use, and suicidality. More than half of young adults reported signs of anxiety or depression. These are huge numbers, really, really huge. We should also acknowledge the additional impact of the social unrest and political and cultural divides our country has been experiencing over the last few years that really adds to the stress and especially for people of color and people of limited means. The pandemic and these co-occurring societal stressors have accelerated the need for services and also exposed the deep problems with access that have existed all along and have now worsened. And of course, this crisis in access has been intermittently exacerbated by the reality of clinicians and other staff in the behavioral healthcare system getting sick themselves and having to quarantine and be unavailable to cover shifts or see patients. You may be aware that the long waiting list for outpatient therapy, especially for children, and the crisis of not having sufficient inpatient beds to meet the heightened need has resulted in some people getting stuck in hospital emergency rooms for multiple days, sometimes weeks, waiting to be transferred to an inpatient unit somewhere in the state. COVID made this all far worse as many inpatient units had to close beds because of the spread of the virus, at the very same time, the need has grown so much. But the pandemic does have a silver lining for behavioral health. Might seem odd to say that, but it really, really does. On the positive side, many more people are talking openly about their mental health challenges. So it's now more likely that individuals will acknowledge when they're struggling and seek help. And much, much harder for healthcare providers government, businesses, and schools to ignore the need to work on solutions to expanding access. Another silver lining is that many behavioral health providers learned how to do telebehavioral health care quickly and well. And I suspect the pandemic accelerated our knowledge and ability to use telehealth by at least a decade. We would never have gotten there so quickly in other conditions. Next slide, please. So 
You might ask why access to behavioral health care has been such a long brewing crisis. The reasons are complex, but have roots in our society's attitude towards mental health and addictions that resulted in behavioral health care being undervalued and underfunded for decades. Our society harbors a stigma about mental health and addictions, mistakenly equating behavioral health problems with weakness or personal failing, rather than seeing it as the health issue that it really is. Pejorative terms like crazy were freely used and tolerated in much the same way that racial or ethnic slurs or mocking of people who are overweight or have other differences from whatever our society labels as the norm have been accepted. Thankfully, these standards have been changing. And for many years, there was an assumption that if you had a mental health diagnosis, especially a major mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, that you were doomed to never be well. But now with therapies and medication, the likelihood of recovery is a well-known concept. But our society's long history of stigmatizing mental illness led to behavioral health care being undervalued compared to physical health care, and therefore chronically underfunded. Insurers have historically paid far less for behavioral health treatment than for primary care and other medical treatment. And employers didn't particularly want generous mental health benefits to be part of their health insurance benefit package, mistakenly thinking it would add too much cost. Now we know that untreated behavioral health issues actually raise the overall cost of medical care and that prevention measures and early intervention and behavioral problems are good investments even for reigning in healthcare costs in general. However, poor rates have driven a lot of behavioral health providers out of the field. There are not a lot of outpatient centers like Riverside centers out there. In fact, nowadays there are far fewer than there used to be. And in Massachusetts, there has also been a steady flow of clinicians, psychiatrists and therapists both, into private practice where many of them don't accept insurance at all, choosing to just take patients who are wealthy enough to pay out of pocket, avoiding the low Medicaid and insurance reimbursement rates and the burdens of prior approvals and documentation required by almost all insurers. And to make matters worse, there's now a national staffing crisis affecting most industries and greatly affecting behavioral health making the access problem even that much worse. For community behavioral health centers, the effect means fewer clinicians available to see people just as the need has grown so much. This causes longer waiting lists and more people ending up in emergency rooms because they couldn't get care early enough to head off problems before they reach crisis proportions. Since community behavioral health centers like Riverside are also the training ground for future clinicians, it also means fewer opportunities for student interns and new graduates to get the supervision required to develop the skills and serve the need down the line. So the impact will, will cascade for, for years to come. Next slide, please. Behavioral health care has really been misunderstood for a long time. And even today, most people think of it only as outpatient office-based psychotherapy or inpatient hospital-based care. But in fact, it's much, much broader. So I'll give you a brief rundown of behavioral health care in 2022. But first, you may not know how community the, the community mental health system came into being. It was actually in response to deinstitutionalization starting in the 1960s. Before that, it was the norm for people with serious mental health conditions to be locked away in really awful institutions for long periods of time, sometimes decades. Since then, we've come a long way and developed a comprehensive system of care in the community for mental health and addiction treatment. 
I'll describe the comprehensive care that's now available, but as you listen, bear in mind that many of these services are only available to people who have Medicaid as their insurance. Ironically, commercial insurance that most of us get from our workplaces don't cover nearly as many options. So if you or a loved one has a serious mental illness, really the best insurance you can have is Medicaid, at least in Massachusetts, where our state has long understood the benefit of a robust array of services. And I, I must say it's not that way all over the country. There are certainly plenty of states where the Medicaid mental health benefit really covers very little, but in Massachusetts and many other states, it's, it is quite robust. So now let's run through some of the components of behavioral health care today that people may be less aware of. I'll start with home-based services. That's where clinicians and allied professionals like peers with lived experience or parents who have experienced navigating the behavioral health system for their kids provide therapy and supports where the individual lives at home. And this is especially useful for children and families. Psychopharmacology. Medications have continued to evolve and advance in both the efficacy of treating symptoms and the reduction of side effects, and medication-assisted treatment for addictions has greatly advanced. Nowadays, prescribers also aren't always psychiatrists. Advanced practice nurse practitioners and even primary care physicians are an increasingly large proportion of prescribers. Then there's telebehavioral health. As I mentioned, many traditional outpatient providers pivoted quickly to telehealth when the pandemic hit, Riverside did. And we know now that it can be as effective as in-person therapy for many, but not all people. And if you're thinking of turning to one of the for-profit online telehealth services advertised on TV, what feels like every 12 minutes, just be sure to check out who the therapist is, what kind of supervision is provided, and read the fine print before you decide. Then there's milieu programs. This includes things like psychiatric day treatment programs, partial hospital programs, and clubhouses where people benefit not just from professional staff, but from interaction with peers. Behavioral health urgent care and crisis intervention. These are services that specialize in assessing and helping when a serious mental health or substance use problem is emerging or when it already reaches crisis proportions. Riverside is the state's designated emergency service provider in a large section of Eastern and Central and South Central Massachusetts, but not in Cambridge. But every city and town in Massachusetts does have a designated emergency service provider. And these ESPs, as we call them, are a really good alternative in a crisis compared to going to a hospital and sitting in an emergency room for hours. Then there's inpatient units. For 99% of people, psychiatric hospitalizations are very short term and reserved for situations when it's unsafe for someone to remain in the community because of concerns for imminent harm to themselves or others. Typically, intensive therapy and medications are started and really within days, people are discharged for follow-up care to the community. Next is residential supports. And these may be long-term that combines housing with clinical treatment and supports for ADLs, activities of daily life, in group living environments, congregate settings, or in individual homes or apartments. Or they can be short-term residential supports, such as non-hospital crisis stabilization, an alternative to hospitalization for many people, or respite beds. Prevention, screening, and training such as the services I mentioned Riverside provides through our MindWise Innovation Division to help kids and adults identify emerging behavioral health issues before a crisis happens, 
learn how to have helpful conversations with students or with coworkers to enable them to get help and train non-mental health professionals such as teachers, school nurses, cafeteria workers, fellow students, parents and others in identifying people who need help and knowing how to intervene. With this, businesses and schools are starting to take responsibility for helping to promote mental wellness among their workforce and student bodies. Then there's trauma response. Riverside operates the statewide trauma response team that helps schools, businesses, communities, and institutions recover psychologically after a traumatic event. The Riverside Trauma Center has done responses to large scale traumatic events such as the Boston Marathon bombing and smaller local events such as to a school after the suicide death of a student. And finally, there's apps. There are many of these out there now, and some of them are really useful, especially those that provide well-informed self-help to manage stress, help us be more centered, find calmness, and things like that. In my opinion, though, beware of apps that promise too much or sound too good to be true, like 24-7 access to therapists on demand the minute you want them. Um, next slide, please. So I want to conclude with what may surprise some of you, the fact that I'm actually quite hopeful for the future of mental health and addiction care in our state and even our country. Well, why, you may ask. Well, for starters, people are talking much, much more openly about their own behavioral health struggles from celebrities to all the rest of us. And because of this, stigma is really starting to fall away rapidly. This is really important. Also, the crisis in access to care that's now so pronounced is making news. The shortage in outpatient and inpatient care is frequently in the newspaper. The pandemic, shown the light on this long running problem. So it is finally getting attention from businesses, government and insurers. There are also now active calls and many more of them for better funding, better access and more parity between physical health care and behavioral health insurance coverage. And in Massachusetts, both the Baker administration and the legislature have been working on efforts and bills to add resources and prioritize behavioral health in ways we've literally never seen before. In fact, the governor's health care bill proposed increasing spending on behavioral health and primary care, which is another very underfunded area, by 30%. Also, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services is directly working on the issue through what they're calling the Behavioral Health Roadmap, which is a vision for improving access and coordination of mental health and substance use care in Massachusetts. Part of the roadmap is new programming like designated community behavioral health centers and behavioral health urgent care centers. And these are currently being procured across the state. Another reason to be hopeful about the future is that employees in workplaces across the country are letting their employers know that their mental health matters and that they expect the corporations and institutions they work for to take responsibility to help them and to do it in more meaningful ways than just telling employees to make sure to eat well and get enough sleep. And many corporations are starting to listen to judge by the growing interest our MindWise division is hearing from businesses as diverse as construction, higher education, and finance. Nationally, there are beginning to be more opportunities for student loan forgiveness and other incentives for clinicians who choose to work in mental health. But to be honest with you, there's still not nearly enough 
it's just the very beginning, just really the tip of the iceberg and, and um, really needs a whole lot more to be meaningful. But then mental health and substance use care even made it into President Biden's State of the Union address, which was just amazing to hear. The president spoke of his plan for improving access to behavioral health care and is asking Congress to fund some of the initiatives I've just mentioned. So will government, insurers, and businesses finally start to fund behavioral health as it should be so that we can begin to turn around the crisis in access? I'm cautiously optimistic that we're beginning to see a positive trend and hopeful that it will be enough to begin to make a difference for the future. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you see my contact information. And if you have um, you know, thoughts or want to be in touch with me after tonight, you, um, you have the information how to do that. My email is probably the, the best way to do it. And with that, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. And I'm going to you know, turn it back to folks at Leslie to uh, move us into an opportunity for some questions and answers. Hi, Marcia. Hi, Susan. I'm Susan Gear, and uh, interim co-chair of the Department of Counseling and Psychology and a long-term faculty member at Leslie in these very areas you've been discussing with us. And that was a wonderful presentation and I'm hoping we can use it in uh, with all of our students. Um, you gave a wonderful overview of the uh, issues facing us and the services, the vast mental health services that are available and have been developed uh, over time. So I'm very grateful for that. It was a beautiful overview of the field. So let me ask you a sort of a beginning question. I am gonna tap into our participants' questions in a minute, but I have a beginning question for you from the point of view of mental health training programs and mental health trainees um, in the, all the fields you're talking about. Uh, we have wonderful students who are highly, highly motivated. And we have training programs that are dedicated to this work and from your point of view, what are the areas of greatest need that you are seeing currently? And if, and if you could run the zoo with training programs, uh, what would you want to see us um, incorporating? And what would you wanna see students um, thinking about in terms of their careers? That's a great question. Thanks for, thanks for the opportunity to talk about that. Um, a, few, a few things, <clears throat> excuse me, come to mind. One is, as we're looking at the, the need that the community is presenting to our programs, one of the areas of really tremendous need nowadays is related to kids and kids' mental health. And, um, and families are really struggling to, um, to figure out how to, help their, how to help their kids. And there really is a huge need for interventions for kids. My hope is that we'll start to have more interventions that happen earlier mm -hmm. so that we're not waiting for kids to develop really serious problems. And we're helping, we're gonna be doing more helpful things to teach kids you know, social, emotional development um, in ways that strengthen them. But ki kids tend to be pretty resilient if we just give them the tools and the abilities. But, um, but the, the, the number of families in distress at this point are really huge. So that, that would be one area that um, I would be thrilled if there's more emphasis, more training, and, and more people interested in sort of taking, taking, taking on the roles of um, getting into children's behavioral health care. Uh, so I, have, I have a specific follow-up question that was posted that might be useful. Uh, uh, someone wants to know what is happening in Massachusetts to expand the number of psychiatric beds for children and adults. 
Well, there's there's a number of things that are going on in Massachusetts. A number of um, the state is putting a lot of a lot of emphasis into trying to help bring more psychiatric beds online. But the truth is that it's um, it's there's never going to be quite enough beds to meet the need if we don't stem the tide of people winding up not getting help early enough so that they're in crisis and needing that level of care. We really have to we really have to address it, not just from the developing more beds, although we need them and they are coming online, but also from the, we got to do more to prevent that from happening and really, really beef up the, the community system so that people can get the help they need when they need it. Because part of what we're seeing now is just, as I was talking about, the lack of access means that people are waiting until things are at crisis proportion because they can't get the help. Um, there's just not enough clinicians, not enough programs to, to see as many people as there as need the help. But the state, the state really is doing a lot for, for trying to do beds, but there's also, as I mentioned, the staffing crisis. And so, you know, you could build beds, but you need staff to staff them too, just like in the community. Well, that's a great lead into a, there's a two part question that someone put up that's very relevant uh, to the staff issues. So the first part of the question is how has Riverside responded to the direct and indirect strains of COVID-19 on behavioral and mental health care clinicians and providers? Well, um, it's a great question. And, you know, there, there's a lot of ways I can answer that. I think one of the things that I'll say is that the, the staff at Riverside are like phenomenal people. They are just unbelievable and really rose to the occasion because when the pandemic hit, um, like most providers, we had started to do some telehealth, but we weren't deep into it. And, um, and we worked with our, all our staff to be able to pivot really quickly and get the support so that they could really rapidly have the tools and the know-how to do telebehavioral health. What we've continued to do is we, we now, as many places do, have a hybrid environment, meaning that our staff in programs where you have options to do both um, online work and in-person work, many of our clinicians are doing that. They're hybrid. So there's some of the time in the office seeing people in person because frankly, some people really do need that and do much better that way. And some of the time, working remotely. And that can that can be really helpful. And, um, and we're, we're, you know, hope we're doing what we can to try to recruit additional staff, because we know that staff in Riverside and many other places, all other places really, are, um, are doing everything they can to try to see as many people as possible and, and and be as helpful as possible because people go into this field because they really want to help people. And um, and but you know we're 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 a little stymied by the the national staffing crisis that's affecting pretty much everybody. So it's it's tough. It's tough. It is tough. And the second part of that question relates uh, to that issue, which is. You know, what, what do you think that Riverside can do to prevent burnout and compassion fatigue and secondary traumatic stress in clinicians and providers? I think um, one, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that it's really important for people to work as part of a team. Being isolated, being, you know, not having colleagues that, that help to support you and that you can consult with both, of, not just about the work, but just about being colleagues and getting through the work together is probably one of the key things that matter. So what I've been impressed by in really all the programs at Riverside, we have about a hundred different programs, is how much the, the people that work with us at Riverside, our colleagues, 
have, have been able to figure out ways, even while people were fully remote, even then, to really be a team, be supportive, have each other's back, and, um, and, and really provide that kind of that level of support. And, and I think it's really important that we, we all manage to stay engaged and communicate. We work really hard on that at Riverside. And we're very large, as, as you heard, so it's a little bit challenging. But um, but with the tools, including the tools we're using now, Zoom and and um, emails and things like that, is not just in person. We're doing what we can to try to stay really engaged with folks because you know we the communities really depend on our on our staff to help them, and um, and we need to really make sure to back them up. Um, here's here's a question that takes us a little bit different direction um, from somebody who's been in the field for a long time. Uh, when I was a young social worker in the 1960s and through maybe the 1980s, places like the Cambridge Guidance Center had a robust group work program, which was very important as a resource for troubled kids referred by school or family. Insurance does not cover that in recent decades, except in cases where all have a diagnosis and programs like that have disappeared. Is there a way to resurrect such programs? Ah, I love that question. And, and it's one of my soapboxes. So, so forgive me for a minute while I go stand on it. Um, I really think that, that we have as a society gone astray by not focusing on prevention and early intervention, which is what this question really is pointing at. Don't wait till somebody has a diagnosis. Like let's, let's be putting out um, psychoeducational groups and strengthening people and helping people to really develop the skills that they need to prevent serious behavioral health issues from developing. I, and, and the person with the question is right. Insurance really hasn't paid for um, paid for prevention. You get paid if you have a you know if you're a clinician if there's a diagnosis and you can you can do it that way. But um, I think I think that we're going to start seeing some of that. Maybe maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but I think we might start seeing some of that happening. Our MindWise division is very focused on those kinds of things, trying to help and not just help by having the mental health professionals know how to intervene and, and be helpful and help um, people develop skills, but having non-mental health professionals, because in my opinion, there's never going to be enough mental health professionals to meet everybody's need all the time. We really have to help everybody in positions where they're working with coworkers, or working with students to really know how to be helpful and how to intervene at that level um, before, we, before we just say, eh, wait till you have a diagnosable disorder and then come talk to us. Thank you Thank for you. your question, that's great. Yeah, uh, and here's a question from someone at the other end of the spectrum in terms of professional life. So a person is a student who's asking, how can organizations like Riverside and a coalition of academic institutions help increase insurance compensation wages and educational access for therapists? It seems like legislation is focused on creating more counseling positions rather than funding for a more livable wage? So, so I think it's both. And I think, as I, as I said, I think there's, there's a lot of voices now saying, you know, you really do have to, insurance companies, government, businesses, you really do have to improve the rates that you're paying because it's really all about the rates. And as I mentioned, the, the rates for behavioral health care have been really low. That's why so many people have left the field. And so many people have gone into private practice and don't take insurance at all. So it, it is not okay for anybody to just say, let's build more programs or have more clinicians. You got to fix the rates so that clinicians can earn a living wage, stay in the field, be motivated to train the next generation, 
and so on. So, so Riverside does a, a lot of advocacy and our trade associations are doing a lot of advocacy. And because of the crisis in access and the fact that so many voices are saying something's got to be done, I am hopeful that probably for the first time in a really long time that there's attention being paid, not just to increasing the number of programs, but increasing the, the rates so that places like Riverside can pay staff what they should be paid and people in private practice can get what they should be getting. And, um, and I think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna happen overnight, but I think, I think there's enough of a drumbeat that I, I do have some optimism that we're gonna start to see this happening. So here's a question specifically about licensed mental health counselors. Um, it's the observation that uh, licensed mental health counselors do not qualify as Medicare providers. This is a person who lives in Barnstable County uh, where there are many persons on Medicare and finding it extremely difficult to say that she cannot as a provider accept their insurance. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, I, I, I love the questions we're getting because you're, many of you are, are sort of tapping right into some of the things that are the things that are, are very frustrating, my pet peeves, and that is one of them. Um, and it's really about regulations because sometimes regulations, government regulations, insurance regulations don't keep up with the times, they just don't. And, and to me, there's no excuse for it because licensed mental health counselors have been recognized as, you know, as an independent, um, independent capable group of uh, professionals in this field for a mm. long time. So it really, it needs to be included. It's like not, it's, it's not helping access to exclude people who um, can really be helpful and make it difficult for people because of the type of insurance that they have to, to only be able to see a narrower band of clinicians. It just doesn't make any sense. So maybe, maybe one of the other um, things that will happen because of the light being shown so firmly on the access problem is some of these kinds of things may be um, taken seriously. We've been, we've been talking about that for a long time. So here's a question that's very relevant uh, for the current environment. I'm gonna combine a few questions uh, in this regard. One was acknowledging the crisis in Ukraine and the needs of uh, Ukrainian communities and a specific question about how does Riverside provide services for those in need who are English language learners? Um, many, many of our programs have staff. We have a lot of staff who are bilingual um, and we love finding clinicians and, and other staff, not just clinicians, but other staff, allied professionals as well, who are bilingual. And, um, and we, we have as many as we can possibly find and there will never be enough of those folks either. So we like pretty much all healthcare providers also have to resort to using translators and we do when we have to. That's great. Um, here's, here's a question um, about teletherapy. Could you discuss the limitations that you are observing about teletherapy and how you overcome them? It's, it's an interesting question because there are, there are both, what we found, um, and we, we actually did a, a survey about I guess a year or so after the pandemic started, and because we were we were wanting to assess was tele tele behavioral health really working? What did people who were on the receiving end of the therapy think about it? What was it meeting their needs? And so we did a survey. We have five outpatient centers. We did a survey of people getting services in our outpatient centers. And I think we wound up getting about, if I'm remembering correctly, about six or 700 responses back, which is a really good um, rate of, of 
responses. And what we learned was that most people, like I forget the percent, 90 something percent of people felt like telebehavioral health really did meet their needs and um, overcame access problems for having to get in the car, drive to an outpatient center, you know, spend half your day between driving there and, and the appointment and so on. So it really was um, seen by people who were receiving the services as very effective. There are some people for whom it worked really well. And we found, our clinicians found, that some people were felt more able to be open over Zoom than sitting face to face. It really, it really freed some people up and some people became much more engaged in treatment, but not all. Some people on the other hand, found it really disconcerting to be sitting there looking at themselves and a clinician on a Zoom or a Skype or whatever they were using. And, um, and it really didn't work very well for them. And for little kids, it's the hardest. It's really hard to, you know, to have a, a really little kid focus on a screen and have a conversation. And, but clinicians, again, were very creative and did things like, um, like figured out how to do games that they could play with children over Zoom. Um, it was really amazed me that people figured out how to do this stuff. So it, so really helping the effectiveness, but it's a very individual thing. People either thrived, felt like it was just, just as good. And then there were some people who just like really couldn't engage with it. Thank you. Here, here's a question that uh, this is since the Riverside and, and Leslie collaboration on campus is new. Uh, there's a question about, you know, how do you see um, the Riverside services benefiting uh, students? Well, I think, I think it's, um, it's for students who will benefit by having professional behavioral health care, including access to prescribing medications when necessary. And um, I think it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's about access. It's about access and it's about um, also a benefit of having more training for students from Leslie, because as I was saying earlier, it's um, the behavioral health world is in a crisis of access and a crisis of staffing, which really does impact on access for everybody and training for students. So, you know, this won't solve the, the big global crisis, but it'll be a little piece. Well, it also, your, your response also answers another question, which was about the high cost of psychiatry uh, and how to access uh, psychiatry at an affordable rate. And what you're suggesting is that the uh, new center can provide some of that. Yep, yep. I think the partnership with Leslie and Leslie's investment in, in trying to help their students to be able to access care and not have, um, not have the type of insurance you happen to have be a block is a, yeah. is a huge benefit. Um, you know, this is, we're getting toward the end of our time and there's a question that hasn't been asked in terms of uh, schools. Um, and as someone asks, what are your thoughts about the effectiveness of individualized education programs in schools for children struggling with mental health issues? In other words, how does an IEP help them? Well, you know, I think that's a, that's a whole, that could be a whole topic unto you it, <laughs> to be honest with you. And I, and I think all, all I'll say about it is that I think the more that we're able to be flexible and tailor things for the individual that we're concerned about, that has the need, the better off people are. The more we try to do cookie cutter stuff and go, everybody does this, then the less we're being responsive and, and effective. So I'm all for anything that's individualized. Well, you know, in winding down here, I, I want to share with you that there are a couple of statements, not questions. 
And the statements are about uh, thanking you for your work uh, and thanking Riverside uh, for outreach services, for family-oriented behavioral health. Um, there's a recognition that that's a, making you and your organization are making a great contribution and, and people are thanking you for it. Wow. Thank you, Susan, for sharing that. And thank those of you who put that up there. That really feels good. So thank you a million. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, we're about out of time. And I don't know if Marcia, if you had any last word that you felt you didn't need to, you couldn't get out there. <laughs> no, I just want to thank, thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, um, Janet. Thank everybody at Leslie for having us. And I'm I'm really looking forward to a long and um, and really exciting continuing collaboration between Riverside and Leslie. It's pretty exciting. Well, I can certainly say that we are very much looking forward to it. We so much appreciate your time, your leadership uh, in, a, in a wonderful organization and the multiple levels at which we can think about the hopeful message and positively affecting generations of uh, clinicians and generations of students. So we thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>